the Sermon on the Mount today, and we're going to cover quite a bit of scripture today. We're going to cover the whole chapter 7, um, but it really all ties together, and, and it's a nice summation of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount because he's laid out all of this stuff about how we should be living, how Christians live. Remember, it's not written for a non-believer. It's not written for a casual Christian. Um, it is written for those that want to be true disciples, followers of Jesus Christ that give their whole life over to him. And so he has hit on some really difficult things throughout this sermon. And now he's going to start to wrap it up and he's going to start to tie it all together and make you think and make me think and make those that heard the sermon for the first time uh, that day think. Because as he's done throughout this whole Sermon on the Mount, he is going right at the Pharisees. Uh, he is just being as bold as possible going right at the Pharisees and the hypocrisy that they're living in. And we've talked a lot about hypocrisy throughout this series uh, because the Pharisees would live in this false righteousness. They would have two lives going on. In public, they would be holier than they actually were. They would appear to be holy. But behind the scenes, it was all for personal gain, personal, um, uh, not personal growth in the sense of becoming a more uh, uh, person of stronger character, but personal growth of their wealth, their fame, their, their status. Um, and in that, they were seeking power. Um, and so, so what Jesus talks about here in Matthew chapter 7 is he's talking about judgment. And judging can be a very, very scary thing for us when we talk about God's final judgment or if we're just talking about someone else judging us or us judging someone else. Uh, when I taught school, I hated, um, there's a certain time of year uh, that is called T-test observation time. And that is when your principal will come and spend an hour in your classroom. You did not like, I did not like that. Some teachers love that. I never understood that why. But they would come and they would observe you and then they would judge how good a teacher you were based on criteria set by um, the, the state. And so I lived in fear of that. I lived in fear because there were times that they could just walk in at any time and do what's called an official walkthrough and you could be counted on. And, and as, as a teacher that wasn't very confident in my craft, I feared that. And that's not the type of judging necessarily that Jesus is talking about here, but what he's talking about is how the Pharisees would live a, this false righteousness and their false righteousness would carry them into a false judgment and because they were hypocrites. They would carry themselves around, like I said, and they would live two lives and they would make themselves look holier than anybody else and they would say all the right things and they would do all the right things and they would uh, pray the, the, the real godly prayers full of religious language and and carry out the law as best they could, but they were twisting the law uh, to where it fit them. And in that, when something didn't line up with what they wanted in their false righteousness, then they would falsely judge someone. And they would make it sound like it was a religious judgment that was coming from God when really it was just coming from inside of them because they didn't like what somebody was doing. And so the Pharisees did this all the time. They lived behind this mask of false righteousness and they judged people falsely. And Jesus calls them out. And unfortunately, this is not something that just stayed in the time of Jesus' ministry. False judging or in, incorrectly judging or unbiblical judging carries on in churches all over the place today. People who are not living a holy life unfairly judge someone else. And this is exactly what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 7. And he's bringing clarity and he's saying, we're going to talk about what true judgment is. What is true biblical judgment? He's not saying judging is wrong. He's saying, what is true biblical judgment? What, what do you need to understand 
to, un, to make sure that what is happening is honoring God. And so there's three things that happen in this passage, but we're going to start in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, and he begins by judging ourselves. Because he says before you judge anyone else, you need to judge yourself because you are going to be judged and are being judged. Look at verse 1 through 5. It says, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. The first principle of judging is that you need to judge yourself. You need to introspectively look at yourself before you can place any kind of judgment on anybody else. Jesus does not forbid us to judge others. As we look throughout the rest of this, you're going to see that Jesus is actually telling us that in, there is an appropriate way to judge other people in a Christian, Christ-like way. He's not forbidding that, but he's saying you need to have careful discrimination and discernment. That's essential for the Christian life. And when we do this, we need to do it through Christian love because Christian love is not blind. And I think it's important to note that he uses the reference of the eye again. First, Philippians 1, 9 through 10 says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Paul is writing there that we need to have clarity. We need to have clear vision. We need to be able to look at things with knowledge and discernment so that we may accurately love. When Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Be careful what you ask for. We need clear eyes because we live in a day, and he talks about it later on in this passage, to beware of false teachers. And Paul writes about it all throughout his writings, beware of false teachers. And if we do not have clear eyes and we do not have a clear heart and judging, we begin to accept everyone who claims to be spiritual. The people of the day saw these Pharisees living their life in a certain way, and so they would follow them because they're like, well, that person is, is, is godly because look at all the things they do to follow the law. And Jesus is saying there's, there's two sides to every story, and you've got to dig in. You've got to look, and if you claim, if you f accept everything who, from someone who claims to be spiritual, you're going to experience confusion. So first, judge yourself. In verses 1 and 2, it says, not only will you be judged, but you are being judged. And he's talking about, in, a, in, in one part of, part of this, he's talking about there's going to be a final judgment. Each and every one of us will experience final judgment. Scripture tells us that. And so God will judge us at the end, at the final judgment. But everything we do right now is being judged by other people. God is going to judge us at the end, but people are judging you every day. And the thing about it is, you are going to reap what you sow. When he says, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Jesus is saying, you're being judged, and you will reap exactly what you sow in this area. So when we look inside of us and check our hearts and make sure we're in the right place, we are actually preparing ourselves for that final judgment. We're keeping ourselves in check. The Pharisees like to play God by judging others. 
And they lost sight of the fact that one day they are going to be judged by God himself. So put that into the perspective of you. You're going around judging people. You have what people would call a judgmental spirit. And think about how harshly you might judge someone. And then put it in the context that God is going to judge you one day. Does that change your view on things? This passage is taken out of context a lot, especially when someone feels unfairly judged. Anybody ever felt unfairly judged? I have. Anybody ever unfairly judged someone? I have. But especially when someone feels unfairly judged, they've been called out for something that is sinful and unholy. And their defense is to take this verse and say, don't judge me. Right? We hear this all the time in a world of tolerance that says, don't judge me for who I am. Don't judge me because I'm doing something you don't agree with. It, we take it out of context, but the scripture here is not saying not to judge. It's saying that if something is unholy, then it should be brought to attention. But before you do it, examine yourself. Examine what's going on in your life. And he uses the illustration of a speck and a plank. Now, a speck in your eye can cause a lot of damage, right? Right? But think about a plank in your eye. That's, that's big. It's a great use of hyperbole here uh, by Jesus. And oftentimes what we end up doing is we make a mountain out of something so small to hide what's going on inside of us. We take something that somebody else is doing that's so very, very small and we judge them and we make it public and we tear them down to hide what is happening on the inside of us. And I can confess that I've done that in my life. And I bet there's times that if you look back introspectively in your life, you've done the exact same thing. You find something that you can divert the attention away from what you're doing and focus it on someone else. Something very small when you've got the whole plank still in your eye. And Jesus has already, we talked about it last week in Matthew chapter 6, he uses the eye as an illustration. And in that, he uses the eye as a way to focus on the light in the darkness, to be able to zero in on something. But here he's using the eye in a different way. The eye is a very delicate organ in your body, and it can be easily damaged. And so it must be protected, because when it's damaged, you can get out of focus Think about if you ever get something in your eye. Like that can bring you to your knees so fast because it just completely distorts everything. And it's painful. You get a little piece of dirt in your eye and it just drives you nuts. If you saw me the last half of this week, you know I was experiencing some eye issues. Um, in fact, Buddy Bowley saw me at Building Supply Friday and he's like, what's wrong with you? Um, I was taking a contact lens out this week, and I scratched my cornea, which is why I'm wearing glasses today, because it's not fully healed yet. Let me tell you, my life was out of focus for a whole lot of the day, Thursday and Friday, because I could not get that speck out of my eye. It felt like somebody had taken a, one of those big redwood trees from California and shoved it into my eye. Because I had a plank in my eye. It threw me off course. It caused me to have to adjust and to try and, 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 and adapt and coordinate. And I wasn't myself. Because I couldn't see properly. I couldn't see clearly. So we've got to look inside our hearts and say, what plank is in my eye? that I need to take care of before I can go to the next step that Jesus talks about, and that's judging other people. I cannot fairly judge someone unless I've judged myself. I cannot be open and loving because we have to take care of the eye. It's delicate, just like relationships with other people. We have to love them and nurture them and be tender with them 
and protect them. And if we're dealing with stuff and, 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 and we don't want to deal with it, and so we, we are afraid of, of it coming to the surface, so we turn the attention to someone else in, in, to protect ourselves, that's not sharing Christ's love with others. That's being very, very self-centered and selfish. So Jesus says first, judge yourself. Now there's a word of caution here. Um, there's two ends of the spectrum when you self, self, become self-aware, self-judge yourself. When you self-judge. There's two ends of the spectrum and you don't want to be on the extreme end of either. The first one is that you just very shallowly, or I just very shallowly, glance in the mirror of the inside of my life. I don't really do a deep introspective look. Oftentimes we fall victim to what Warren Wiersbe calls the deception of shallow examination. We don't look at ourselves honestly and thoroughly. We just do a quick check of our motives and then trick ourselves into believing our hearts are right and are in the right place. That's real easy to do, especially if we don't want to uh, uh, go any further than surface level. And one of the ways that we do this is we don't spend time with God. We don't spend time in God's word. We don't pray. We only show up on Sunday mornings and then talk the right talk, but we don't go any deeper than that because we're afraid of what God is going to turn up inside of us. So we stay very, very shallow in that judging of ourselves. That's a dangerous place to be. Why? Because we're not ever letting the spirit really take root of us and take hold of us. The second side, the other extreme, is that we beat ourselves up. We fall into this trap of being our own worst critic and we are constantly, constantly, constantly digging deep and finding every fault that we possibly have and just beating ourselves up over it and forgetting, losing sight, not taking the speck or the plank out of our own eye and forgetting that, yes, we all are sinners. I'm a sinner and you're a sinner, every person in this room. But what I know in my heart is even though I'm a sinner, when I look inside of myself, I can't beat myself up because I have faith and hope in the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And so the danger is that we lose sight of the faith and hope that comes from grace in G from Jesus Christ. We lose sight of that. And so we beat ourselves up and we begin to have these feelings of, of unworthiness and, and shame. And we don't feel like we're good enough. And the enemy will pounce on that. And they will deep, he will deepen that feeling of inadequacy. Or he'll take it the other way and turn it into legalism. He's got many tricks up his sleeve. But when we judge ourselves fairly through the lens of the grace and love of Jesus Christ, then we can see clearly. And then we can see clearly enough to go to the next part of this where we are to judge others. The reason we judge others from a Christ-like standpoint, the reason Jesus says it's okay to judge, judge others is this. In 1 Peter 2.9 Peter says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, when you make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you become part of the royal priesthood of believers. You gain everything that every other believer gains. And there's a responsibility that comes with that. And that responsibility, it's a privilege and a responsibility to handle the holy things of the Lord. And those holy things that we are to handle are God's word. We're to protect God's word. And this is why we must judge others. 
Because if they're diluting God's word, if they're perverting God's word, if they're changing it, then they need to be made aware of this. And what I want you to hear is this isn't just a false teacher spreading false information. Because there's plenty of them out there teaching false theology. And I want you to hear me say this, and this is, I don't think I've said this from the stage as a, as a pastor, but I would tell people all the time when I served under other pastors and they would come to me and say, well, the pastor said this, so it must be true. And I'm like, really? You believe it just because the pastor said it? Go check it with the Bible. Just because I say it doesn't mean it's necessarily right. Because I'm human and I mess up. And sometimes I mess up a whole lot more than others. And your responsibility as part of the priesthood of believers is to take the things that I hear God saying for me to tell to you and go check it, fact check it with scripture. That's protecting God's word. But this just isn't talking about that. It's also talking about other believers living their lives wrong, unholy, not pleasing to God. See, the Pharisees were masters at living two lives, and we could fairly call them hypocrites. And when a believer lives this way, when a believer walks through life and says, I am a Christian, I believe in Jesus Christ, and their life doesn't match it, it cheapens the gospel. And it is not being a good steward of the word God has given us. And so look at what Jesus says in verse 6. He says, do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Something so precious, we're not going to feed it to the dogs or throw it in the pig pen. We're going to cherish it. We're going to protect it. We're going to keep it holy. We might say, that's, that's re really hard to do. How do I do that? Well, he continues in verse 7. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask of him? Jesus is talking about wisdom and discernment here. This, this little passage could be put anywhere in the Gospels. Ask and I'll give it to you. And people take it out of context and that's where prosperity theology comes from. But Jesus is using this in the context of judgment. And says in order to have clear eyes, in order for that, that, that log, that plank, that tree to be taken out of your eye, you need wisdom and spiritual discernment. And the only way you get that is by asking. Solomon prayed for wisdom. And he's known as the wisest man in the history of the world. He says in verse 11, If you then who are evil know how to give good, good, give good gifts to your children. We, we spoil our kids. Even if, even if we... Don't give them much. We spoil them more than the rest of the world spoils our kids. Spoils their kids. Because we have first world problems in our life. Versus third world. And we are all evil because we have a sin nature. And Jesus says, if you who are evil, if you who are a sinner, if you who have a sin nature know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the holy, righteous all-knowing, all-powerful Father in heaven give good things to those who ask for him. If you ask God to give you wisdom and discernment in this area, he will give it to you. It might not look the way that you think it does. It might not sound the way it should. Have you ever been in a difficult conversation with someone and you said something and you're like, where did that come from? I have no clue 
why I said that. But if you prayed before that, there's a good chance that that was the Holy Spirit speaking through you and giving you the wisdom and discernment of the things to say. He continues um, in this chapter with the golden rule. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And we stop there so often and say, do unto others as they would do unto you, do unto you, do what do to them what you want them to do to you. Treat them the way you want them to treat you. We teach our kids that from a very early age. Treat others in the way that you would hope that they would act towards you. And Jesus brings this into scripture, but he continues in this passage with enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you, but go through the narrow gate. Live differently. When you judge someone, judge them in love and tenderness and walk through it with them. Because it's easy to go the way of the world. That's the wide gate. And they judge and they treat people unfairly. And then when someone treats them the way they, they do, they cry that it's not fair. And they cry intolerance and um, all the other political woke buzzwords that are out there today that we see on a daily basis. But when you're a believer in Christ and Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, That's walking in love, which is the narrow gate. And it says only a few will find it because not everyone will come to know Christ. It's the way that leads to life. It's hard. Why is it hard? Because we have a sin nature. It's hard for us to get out of our own way. And it's hard when the world is saying this is the way to do it. And this is how we're going to treat people. And this is how we're going to treat you. And your inside says, if they're going to judge me, I'm going to judge them. And Jesus says, do it in love. Pray for wisdom and discernment. Get into God's word and figure out the appropriate way to do it. Because if you don't, then the next warning that I give you is very, very important. And I want to back up just a second to this golden rule because there's a couple other things I want you to see here. This sermon, remember, is only for believers. So this golden rule, do unto others as you might do unto you, is only for believers. It's a good principle to apply in life, but it is only focused on believers here. And it must be practiced in every area of life. The person who practices the golden rule refuses to say or do anything that would harm himself or others. And so if we decide to judge people and we don't judge them underneath this principle, we become proud and critical and our own spiritual character breaks down. So be very, very careful that when you practice this golden rule, it applies to every area of your life. Take the plank out of your eye. When we practice it, it releases the love of God in our lives and it enables us to help others, even those who want to hurt us. And oftentimes that means paying a price. If we want God's best for ourselves and for others, but others want to resist God's will, guess what? It's going to be hard. There's going to be tension. There's going to be friction because they're going to oppose us. And we are salt and salt stings an open wound and light exposes dirt. And that's why when he says enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and for the way is easy that leads to destruction 
and those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. It's hard to walk through life with opposition. Watched football yesterday. And they talk about guys that are tough runners, that they get into the line and no matter what's hitting them, they just keep pushing through. And unfortunately, my, my team last night, I was watching Tech play. We did not win last night. And um, there was a situation that guy got into the, he, he was a tough runner for, for the other team and he, he broke free and everything. And he was headed down the sideline. He was about the four yard line. And there was a Tech player coming and he could make life very, very hard for him and just tune him up, knock him into oblivion. And he stopped, and the guy walked in easy. And the announcers were like, what was that guy doing? He made life so easy for that running back. Well, let me tell you, the Christian life is not like that. When we walk in this rule, in this principle, we're getting hit from every direction, everywhere we go but we stay focused on going through that narrow gate because the prize is on the other side. And the way we see this is in verse 18. Beware of false prophets, not, yeah, 15, sorry. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn brushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by your fruits. And this is beginning into the idea that not only are we to judge ourselves, are we to judge others, but we will be judged by God. You will know by their fruits. And it's a way for us to see someone, are they really walking in Christ? Because you will see fruit in their life. You will see healthy fruit, spiritual fruit. You will see people being discipled and growing in Christ. You will not see bad fruit. Bad fruit falls away and that tree dies. You will know by their fruit. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing because they're there to seek and destroy. Jesus continues in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. If you do not see fruit in someone's life, this passage is a warning to them that at that final judgment, I will say, I never knew you. You said you did all these good things. You even acted like you were doing these good things, but I never knew you. And so in closing of this passage in verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Jesus lays out this whole sermon and he ends it saying, I've got the authority. I've been given the authority. And the crowds were astonished because he's telling them, I've just given you the pathway to a holy, righteous living. And I've told you here, if you're obedient to God's word, you're going to build your house on the foundation of the word of God, then it'll last. 
And he uses these illustrations at the end, and I think this is a great way to close. Three questions that he asks. The first question he asks is about two ways. And we just lost it. Because I have my questions on there. I just put little reminders. Which way are you going? Are you going the narrow way or the wide way? Which way are you headed? The second question. You got those, Michelle? Are they on their way? Sorry. Technical difficulties. No, it's not going to work. Okay. Two trees. Are you bearing good fruit or are you bearing bad fruit? And I think these are questions that you put into your life as you self-introspectively look at yourself, look at your heart. Which way am I going? Two ways, narrow or wide. Two trees, good fruit or bad fruit. And two houses. If I built my house on the foundation of God's word or if I built it on something that is false and fleeting. If I built it on sand. I love going to the beach. But the thing I hate most about the beach besides not being able to get rid of all the sand when you come home is when you go and you stand maybe ankle deep in the water, the waves, and if it's really good sand, you sink and you start to fall into that sand or you're trying to walk up in the sand, walk up a hill and the sand just falls underneath you and you can't grab your footing. But then you get to the area that's, that's rock or solid and you get that secure footing and you can stand and you can look out over the water and see God's power and you can feel secure. Are you building your house on the rock? Or are you building your house on the sand? Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is the rock for us to place our life on, for us to build upon. But you got to have a relationship with him to do that. Remember I said that this was written for believers, so you have to be a believer in Jesus Christ. You have to believe that God sent his son, his one and only son, to die on the cross for your sins. Because we're all sinners. We've already established that fact. So that at the end of three days after he died, he rose again, and our sins are no more. Even though we will be judged when we put our faith and hope in Jesus Christ and we profess that Jesus is Lord and believe that he did what he said he did, our sins are no more. He'll say, you're forgiven. Come on in. Got a mansion for you. But there will be those that have lived a life that looks like they've done that, but never have. And only you know that. I can't tell you if you have or not. No one else in here can tell you if you have or not unless they look at you and say, I just don't see fruit. Just don't see good fruit. But Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And in the scripture, that was a direct warning to the Pharisees of the day. But it's something for us to introspectively look and say, God, have I truly made you Lord of my life? So we're going to have a time of reflection to do that. The band's going to come up and close us in prayer. And I just pray that you would ask God those questions. What way am I going? What fruit am I bearing? And is my house built on the rock or is it built on sand?